hello friends hope all of you are doing well welcome back to mains answer writing basics program being conducted by team india for ias in this video we are going to analyze gs1 paper questions that is upsc mains 2024 gs1 paper questions and also we are going to discuss answer approach to the questions so this is the part 4 of the question analysis and answer approach of the gs1 paper in the earlier part 3 questions we have discussed question number 1 to question number 15 in the part 1 we have discussed question number 1 to 5 in the part 2 we have discussed question number 6 to 10 in the part 3 we have discussed question number 11 to 15 and in the part 4 we are going to discuss question number 16 to question number 20 this question analysis and answer approach video will help the aspirants to understand the demand of the gs1 questions how to frame answers to the questions and also what should be the content coming to the question number 16 the question number 16 is what is a twister why are majority of the twisters are observed areas around the gulf of mexico this question has two parts in the first part the question is asking what is twister so we have to define what is twister and we should write its features in the first part and in the second part the question is asking why are the majority of the twisters observed in areas around the gulf of mexico so this question is for 15 marks and the word limit is 250 so coming to the answer approach we have to begin our answer by writing an introduction in the introduction either we should define what is twister or else we should mention any fact related to twister like for example out of the twisters that are observed in a year 1200 twisters annually observed along the gulf of mexico coast so this we can write as an introduction so if we know about the facts related to twister we can go we can write this as an introduction if we don't know any fact or statistics or data related to twisters so the best uh, way to define the best way to introduce is by writing the definition of the twister so coming to the definition of twister twister it is more commonly known as a tornado it is a violently rotating column of air that extends from a thunderstorm to the ground while tornadoes or also the twisters can form in many parts of the world the majority are observed in the areas around the gulf of mexico particularly in the central united states this area it is famously known as tornado alley so this is about introduction now we should define or we should write the characteristics of a twister so coming to characteristics of twister are also called as tornado definition this we have already discussed in the introduction coming to size and intensity tornadoes they can range in the width from few meters to few meters to more than a kilometer so more than kilometer and the most violent tornadoes can reach wind speeds of up to 500 kilometers per hour so 500 kilometers per hour coming to the duration of the twister so the life span of a tornado is usually short so the life span of a twister it is a very short and it ranges from few seconds few seconds to more than 1 hour more than 1 hour so coming to the speed of tornadoes the speeds range from 10 km per hour to 100 km per hour after this we have to briefly discuss the formation of tornado also called as twister so for the formation of tornado the first condition is there should be a severe thunderstorm development if there is no development of thunderstorm then the formation of tornado will not takes place then the second uh, factor responsible for the formation of or necessary condition for the formation of tornado is wind shear wind shear is a critical factor in tornado formation this wind shear it refers to the change in wind speed and uh, direction with the height as the height increases if there is any change in wind speed and direction that is called as wind shear then the third feature is rising warm moisture for the formation of tornado a large amount of warm moisture is required so if there is no warm moisture then there is no formation of tornado 
So then the third, fourth feature is condensation and funnel cloud formation. So when the warm moisture, when it rises in the atmosphere, so this causes rotation. This rotating air, it intensifies and condensation occurs and a funnel cloud forms. This funnel cloud becomes a tornado if it touches the ground. So then the next is touchdown. So once the funnel cloud it reaches the ground, it becomes a full-fledged tornado. It can move across the landscape, landscape causing damage to everything on its path. So this is about the formation of a tornado. Next we have to answer the second part of the question. Why are the majority of the twisters observed in areas around the Gulf of Mexico? So the first point is geographical factors. The Gulf of Mexico region, it is a unique geographical intersection where warm moist air from the Gulf of Mexico meets the cold dry air from Canada and Rocky Mountains. So this creates ideal conditions for the development of severe thunderstorms and tornadoes. Then the second factor is warm moist air from the Gulf of Mexico. So the Gulf of Mexico, it provides a near constant source of warm moist air. This air mass is critical for creating the instability needed to form the strong thunderstorms. The third factor is cold dry air from the Rockies and Canada. So these cold dry airs from Rockies and Canada, they create a sharp temperature gradient. So this, unstable, this creates an unstable atmosphere which enhances the potential of a tornado formation. Then the fourth factor is jet stream and wind shear. The presence of jet stream, a fast moving current of air in the upper atmosphere, further enhances this tornado producing capability of storms in the region. The jet stream creates a wind shear which contributes to the rotation necessary for tornadoes to form. So the next point is seasonality. So tornadoes in the Gulf of Mexico region are most common in spring and early summer months when the interaction between warm and cold air masses is most intense. Then the sixth point is flat terrain. So the relatively flat terrain of the central US, that is the Great Plains, it contributes to the frequency of tornadoes as it allows for the unimpeded movement of the air masses and storm systems. So this is all about the why majority of the twisters are observed in areas around the Gulf of Mexico. So these are all the favorable factors for the formation and uh, continuation of the tornadoes or twisters in the Gulf of Mexico region. Then we have to write the conclusion. In the conclusion, we should write like the interaction of warm moist air from the Gulf of Mexico with the cold dry air from the north and west creates the perfect conditions for the tornado formation, making this area as the world's most tornado prone region. Now we have to discuss question number 17. So what is the regional disparity? How does it differ from diversity? How serious is the issue of regional disparity in India? So the question, it has two parts. So in the first part, it is asking about regional disparity and its comparison with diversity. And in the second part, it is asking about the the issue of the regional disparity, the seriousness of the regional disparity in India. So the question is for 15 marks and the word limit is 250 words. So coming to the introduction, so in the introduction either we should define what is regional disparity. We have to define regional disparity. Then we have to or else we have to define what is diversity? After defining regional disparity, we should define what is diversity. So after defining both regional disparity and diversity, we should write the differences between regional disparity and diversity. So here we have listed the major differences between regional disparity and diversity. So coming to the definition, regional disparity means inequality in economic development and opportunities across the regions. So whereas the diversity means it is differences in the culture, language, ethnicity, and geography, etc. Coming to the nature, regional disparity, it implies imbalance and inequality, whereas the diversity, it reflects variety and differences. Coming to the implications, regional disparity, it creates socioeconomic inequalities, whereas the diversity, 
it can coexist with harmony and development. Example for regional disparity, that is the differences in GDP between Maharashtra and Bihar, whereas the diversity, linguistic diversity between Tamil Nadu and Punjab. Coming to the outcome, regional disparity, it led to the uneven development and poverty in some regions, whereas the diversity, it promotes cultural richness. Coming to its focus, the regional disparity it focuses on economic and developmental issues, whereas diversity, it focuses on socio-cultural and ethnic differences. So these are the major difference between regional disparity and diversity. So before we move into the second part of the question, that is the uh, seriousness of the issue of regional disparity in India. So we should briefly also talk about the causes for the regional disparity in India. So the first cause is historical factors. So the British policies, they favored few regions, particularly like Bengal and Bombay presidency. So these regions, they developed compared to the Bihar and Northeastern states. Then the second factor is natural resource endowment. The regions which have natural resources, they developed comparatively the re over the regions which don't have, which uh, lack natural resources. Then the third region is geographical factors. So coastal regions with better access to ports and international trade, such as Gujarat and Maharashtra, they have seen foster development compared to the landlocked states like Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh. Fourth factor is industrialization. So states like Gujarat, Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra. So they have seen industrialization. So they are more developed compared to states like Bihar, Odisha and Northeastern states. Then the fifth point is infrastructure development. So the, the southern and western states, they have more advanced infrastructure compared to northern and eastern states. Then the sixth point is investment and policy support. Some regions, they have attracted better investment and policy support from the government. So they have better developed. Example, Gujarat, Maharashtra and uh, southern states. Then coming to seventh point, social and economic development. The southern state and western state, they have higher levels of literacy and social awareness. So because of that, they are, they are, they are ahead in the better human development indicators. Whereas states like Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, they are lagging behind in education health. So this is reinforcing the regional disparity in India. So coming to the extent of regional disparity in India, the first one is economic inequality. States like Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu and Gujarat, they are contributing significantly to India's economy, while Bihar, Odisha and Northeast, their contribution to India's GDP is less. So this is creating a huge gap in economic opportunities. Then the second one is infrastructure gaps. So the western and southern states of India, they have a better infrastructure. While the regions in Northeast, Central India and Eastern India, they continue to struggle with inadequate roads, railways and electricity. Because of this infrastructure gap, there is a widespread disparity between southern and western state with that of the eastern and northeastern states. The third point is human development index. States like Kerala and Goa, they rank highest on the human development index due to better healthcare, education and living standards. Whereas the states like Bihar, Jharkhand and Uttar Pradesh, they consistently score lower on these parameters, reflecting the severity of the regional disparities. Then the fifth point is Fourth point is poverty. So poverty rates are much higher in states like Bihar, Odisha and Uttar Pradesh, where economic development has seen has been slower. On the other hand, states like Haryana, Punjab and Maharashtra, they have relatively lower poverty rates. Fifth point is migration patterns. The growing regional disparities, it led to the migration from less developed states like Bihar, Uttar Pradesh and Odisha to more developed regions like Delhi, Maharashtra and Gujarat. So this is creating social and economic challenges in both source and destination states. Sixth point is social inequality. Social issues like caste-based disparities, gender inequalities and lack of education are more pronounced in less developed states, contributing to the further regional imbalances. Then next we should discuss the seriousness of regional disparity in India. So the coming to first one is economic consequences. So because of regional disparity, there is unbalanced growth in India and investment is concentrated in few states. Not It is not distributed evenly in all over India. Then coming to a social consequences, there is an increased interstate migration from 
less developed region to more developed regions. And because of that, there is a frustration and social unrest in uh, less developed state. And also in more developed state, because of the lack of amenities, there is frustration and social unrest in major metro cities like Met, Delhi, Mumbai and Bangalore. So this regional disparity also has a political consequences like demand for special status uh, from the states like Bihar and Andhra Pradesh. And also this regional which, uh, disparity it is creating political instability such as disparities can fuel regionalism and parochial, parochial politicals, politics. So regional disparity is also causing environmental consequences like certain regions, overdevelopment in certain regions and underdevelopment in others can lead to the environmental degradation. So industrial regions, they face pollution and resource depletion while underdeveloped regions suffer from underutilization of the natural resources. So after writing the seriousness of the regional disparity in India, we should also briefly mention the government measures to address the regional disparities. So the first one is balance of regional development programs like backward region grant fund, aspirational district program, special category status. So this we should write. Then in the second point, infrastructure development. For infrastructure development, we should mention schemes like Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana, Bharat Mala Yojana and Sagar Mala Yojana. Then the third point is industrial incentives. So incentives for setting up industries in the backward regions like tax holidays, subsidies and the establishment of special economic zones in the remote areas. It has been initiated to encourage industrial growth. Then the fourth point is decentralization of power. So initiatives like Panchayat Raj system and local governance are designed to empower local bodies and facilitate regional development based on local needs and aspirations. Then the fifth point is education and skill development, skill India mission, national apprenticeship promotion scheme, Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan. They aim to improve education and employment, employment ability in the backward regions in order to bridge the gap in human capital development. So after writing government measures to address the regional disparity, we should conclude the answer. So in the conclusion, we should mention both the concept that is while diversity is a reflection of India's cultural richness, regional disparity poses a serious challenge to its development and stability. Addressing these regional disparities requires balanced economic policies, targeted infrastructure development and investment in education and human capital. Now we will discuss question number 18 and its answer approach. Coming to the question number 18, despite comprehensive policies for equity and social justice, Underprivileged sections are not yet getting the full benefits of affirmative action envisaged by the constitution. Comment. So the question is uh, one single part. So it is for 15 marks and 250 words. The question is asking, despite comprehensive policies for, policies for equity and social justice. So even though government has brought the many policies regarding the equity and social justice, the underprivileged sections of society, they are not getting the, they are not getting the full benefits of the affirmative action. So that has been envisaged by the constitution. So comment. So we have to, since the directive word is comment, we have to talk about policies and uh, policies for equity and uh, social justice. Then we should uh, write whether the these policies will get any positive benefits to the underprivileged sections. Then we should mention that the progress in the underprivileged sections. Then if not, if uh, negative balance or challenges in the implementation of these policies. So we should write that. Then after that, we have to talk about the affirmative action that has been envisaged in the constitution. We should briefly write about this also. Then we should write the way forward in order to address the challenges so this is the framework of the answer so we have to begin our answer by writing an introduction in the introduction we should write about the indian constitution provides a robust framework for affirmative action aimed at ensuring equity and social justice for historically marginalized and underprivileged sections of society so this we should write in the introduction so after writing this we should talk about the constitutional provisions for affirmative action. So in the constitution, the following are the articles that are 
that have provisions for affirmative action. First one is Article 15 and Article 16. So they prohibit the discrimination on the grounds of caste, religion or gender and also provide for reservation in educational institutions and public employment for SC, ST and ODCs. Then we should talk about Article 46. It mandates that promotion of educational and economic interest of the weaker sections of societies. Coming to Article 335, it provides for reservation of seats in the legislature and jobs in the government services for SCs and STs. Coming to Article 330 and 332, it provides for the reservation of seats for SCs and STs in the Lok Sabha and State Legislative Assemblies. Then Article 243 and 243. So they provide for reservation in panchayats and municipalities for SCs, STs and women to ensure political participation. Then we should discuss the challenges in achieving full benefits of the affirmative action. So what are the various challenges in achieving the benefits of affirmative action in order to ensure social justice and equity? So the first one is social stigma and discrimination. So despite legal provisions, there, are, there is a cost based discrimination continues in India in various forms particularly in the rural areas. So there are the SCs and STs often face exclusion in access to public goods, education and healthcare. Then the second point is economic disparities. Many underprivileged sections, especially in rural areas and remote areas, they remain in poverty due to failure to failure of economic policies to reach them. The lack of employment, economic empowerment leads to low access to education and employment opportunities despite reservation being provided. Then the third point is poor implementation and corruption. The corruption in the administration, so it is causing the poor implementation of the government schemes and policies like scholarships, grants and reservation in education and jobs. So this is resulting in benefits not reaching the intended beneficiaries. Then the fourth point is educational backwardness. The high dropout rates among the marginalized groups due to economic hardships and social factors limiting their educational attainment and subsequently their access to employment opportunities. Then the fifth point is limited political representation. The patriarchal structure and caste hierarchies, they often limit the active participation of marginalized communities in decision making processes. Sixth point is inequality within the marginalized groups. So there is a growing inequality within SCs, STs and OBCs with the certain subgroups such as criminal here, they are benefiting more from affirmative action while others, particularly the most backward classes and nomadic tribes, they remain, they remain severely disadvantaged. Then the seventh point is geographic disparities. So the marginalized groups who are living in backward regions such as tribal areas, hilly terrains and rural hinterlands they are often left out of the developmental process. Then the eighth point is inadequate policy design. Many affirmative action policies are one size fits all approach, failing to account for the diverse challenges faced by different marginalized groups. So these policies which are aimed at scheduled caste may not necessarily address the unique issues faced by the tribal communities. For instance, in terms of access to forest rights or livelihood resources. So these are the challenges in achieving the full benefits of the affirmative action. So then we should address also why the underprivileged sections are not getting full benefits. The first point is lack of awareness. So many underprivileged sections, especially in remote and rural areas, are unaware of their rights and benefits available to them under the affirmative action policies. This is due to literacy, lack of outreach programs and information asymmetry. Then the second point is bureaucratic red tape. So what is happening? The complex procedures and bureaucratic hurdles make it difficult for marginalized community to avail the benefits such as scholarships, reservations and financial aid. The third point is social exclusion. Despite affirmative actions, social exclusion and caste based prejudices, they continue to marginalize the scheduled caste, scheduled tribes and OBCs. Then the fourth point is economic vulnerability. Many underprivileged groups are trapped in poverty cycles. They may lack the economic means to take, to take the full advantage of educational and employment reservations. So then what are the measures to enhance the effectiveness of affirmative action? The following are the measures. The first one is awareness and outreach programs. The government should create more awareness 
via outreach programs like garas root campaigns using media and ngos then the second point is strengthening education and skill development so enhancing access to quality education and vocational training for scheduled castes scheduled tribes and obcs and other marginalized sections is crucial for empowering them to take the advantage of economic disparities the third point is improving implementation and uh, targeting so the government schemes aimed at empowering underprivileged sections need better monitoring targeting and implementation strict penalties for corruption and leakages in the distribution of benefits should be enforced then the fourth point is inclusive economic growth so efforts should be made to promote inclusive and economic development particularly in backward regions through special economic zones rural infrastructure and employment generation programs then the fifth point is decentralization and local empowerment so empowering local governance institutions like panchayats and urban local bodies with greater autonomy and resources can ensure that the affirmative action benefits reach the grassroots then the sixth point is social awareness programs social and cultural barriers to equality need to be addressed through awareness campaigns anti discrimination laws and promotion of social inclusion at all levels from school to workplaces so these are the measures to enhance the effectiveness of the affirmative action then we should write the conclusion coming to the conclusion despite comprehensive constitutional provisions and affirmative action policies the full benefits have not yet reached the underprivileged sections of society due to systemic barriers social discrimination poor policy implementation and ineffective targeting now we will discuss question number 19 and its answer approach question number 19 is like this globalization has increased urban migration by skilled young unmarried women from various classes how has this trend impacted upon their personal freedom and relationship with family so the question is uh, asking about the trend of globalization with respect to urbanization urban migration especially skilled young and unmarried women so because of the globalization there is a increased economic opportunities for skilled young unmarried women in urban in urban metro centers so this is causing urban migration so because of this so how this is this trend is impacting the personal freedom and relationship with the family of the these young unmarried women so the question has two parts and it is for 250 words and 15 marks coming to the introduction in the introduction we should write briefly about the influence of globalization globalization has profoundly influenced various aspects of life particularly in developing countries where urban migration has surged so one of the notable trend is the migration of skilled young unmarried women from diverse socio economic backgrounds to the urban areas in search of better employment opportunities and lifestyles so after writing introduction we should write about the factors contributing to urban migration of young women so the factors are as follows first one is economic opportunities globalization has expanded the job markets particularly in urban centers leading to the increased demand for skilled labor especially in the fields like information technology healthcare education and hospitality then the second point is education and skill development access to higher education and vocational training has improved the empowering women with skills needed to compete in urban job markets so this educational attainment is often a catalyst for migration then the third point is social aspirations the rise of modern values influenced by global culture has encouraged young women to aspire for independence personal growth and professional success urban areas are perceived as spaces where such aspirations can be realized then the fourth point is changing gender norms globalization has contributed to evolving gender norms promoting the idea of women as independent individual with rights to education and employment this cultural shift has encouraged young women to pursue careers away from their traditional roles now we will discuss the impact of this trend on personal freedom of the women so the first one is increased autonomy 
so urban migration often grants women greater independence and autonomy over their lives so many young women find the freedom to make choices regarding their careers lifestyle and personal relationships without the constraints the second point is enhanced social integra- interaction so cities offer diverse social networks allowing women to form friendships and professional relationships that expand their horizons these networks can provide emotional support mentorship and opportunities for collaboration then the third point is exposure to new ideas and lifestyles so living in urban environment exposes women to different cultures ideas and lifestyles so this broadens their perspective this exposure can lead to change in personal values beliefs and aspirations fostering the sense of agency then the fourth point is increased participation in public life urban migration facilitates women's involvement in civic and political activities as they gain confidence and skills many young women become advocates for issues such as gender equality social justice enhancing their public presence so these are all the impacts on the personal freedom of the women coming to impact on family relationship the first one is shift in traditional roles the migration of young women often challenges the traditional family roles and expectations so because of this trend families may experience tension as women assert their independence leading to shifts in power dynamics within the household then the second point is evolving family structure migration can result in changes to family structures with some women choosing to remain single or delay marriages to focus on their careers this shift can lead to altered expectations regarding marriage and motherhood then the third point is interpersonal conflicts the quest for personal freedom may lead to conflicts with family members who hold traditional views on gender roles young women may face resistance or disapproval from family members particularly parents who may have different expectations for their futures then the fourth point is revise responsibilities as young women migrate they may negotiate new roles and responsibilities within their families some may take on the role of financial providers supporting their families back home while others may seek to establish independence from familial obligations then the fifth point is maintaining family ties despite challenges many young women strive to maintain strong connections with their families advances in communication technology facilitate regular interaction allowing them to share their experiences and maintain emotional bonds despite physical distance so these are the impacts on family relationships now we have to discuss challenges faced by migrant women the first one is workplace discrimination many women face workplace discrimination with respect to gender discrimination and sexual harassment then second one is safety and security concerns in the new localities urban environments can pose safety challenges especially for women living alone issues such as harassment violence and lack of safe housing can impact their sense of security and freedom then the third point is balancing work and family young women often grapple with the dual burden of work and familial expectations balancing career options aspirations with the responsibilities towards family can create stress and lead to the feelings of guilt and inadequacy then the fourth one is mental health issues the pressure of urban living coupled with expectations from family and society can lead to mental health challenges like anxiety isolation or depression due to rapid changes in their lives so in the conclusion we should write some suggestions to address the challenges like policy makers civil society and communities must work together to create supportive environments that empower these women while addressing the challenges they face so this is all about answer approach to the question number 19 of gs1 paper 2024 now we will discuss question number 20 that and its answer approach critically analyze the proposition that there is a high correlation between india's cultural diversities and socio economic marginalities so the question asking about the correlation between the india's cultural diversity and socio economic marginality so the question is for 250 words and uh, 15 marks
we have to begin our answer by writing an introduction in the introduction we should talk about india's rich cultural and diversity india is home to a multitude of ethnicities languages religions and traditions this diversity while a source of national pride often intersect with socio economic marginalities leading to disparities in access to resource opportunity and social justice so this we should write in the introduction then we should write about the cultural diversities in india so first one is ethnic and linguistic diversities india is home to over 2000 distinct ethnic groups and more than 1600 languages so this diversity is reflected in numerous customs practices and beliefs that characterize the different communities the second point is religion religious pluralism the country hosts major religions such as hinduism islam christianity sikhism buddhism jainism alongside numerous tribal and folk religions this religious diversity influences cultural practices social norms and community dynamics then the third point is regional differences geographical variations give rise to distinct regional cultures including differences in cuisine festivals art forms social practices regions such as punjab kerala and northeast india showcase unique cultural identities now we will try to understand the correlation between cultural diversity and socio economic marginalities in india first we will uh, discuss about poverty and economic inequality the marginalized communities in india often linked to cultural identities experience higher rates of poverty and limited access to basic services so this is reflected in poverty and economic inequality then second coming to educational disparities access to a quality education is uneven across different cultural groups often correlating with socio economic status tribal communities and lower caste groups frequently face barriers to education resulting in lower literacy rates then the third point is employment opportunities employment opportunities are not uniformly distributed marginalized groups often have limited access to formal employment relegating them to informal sectors with inadequate wages and job security the fourth point is social exclusion cultural diversities often manifest in social hierarchies and discrimination certain groups such as scheduled caste and scheduled tribes face systemic exclusion and stigma stigmatization further entrenching socio economic marginalities now we will discuss correlation between cultural diversities and socio economic marginalities the first one is caste and class dynamics the caste system deeply rooted in indian society creates socio economic hierarchies where lower castes and tribal communities often experience systematic disadvantages the cultural identity associated with caste often determines their access to resources opportunities and social mobility then the second point is geographical disparity certain regions particularly those with diverse tribal populations experience higher rates of poverty and marginalization for example tribal belts in states like chhattisgarh jharkhand and odisha they face challenges such as land alienation lack of infrastructure and limited access to markets then the third point is gender inequality cultural practices and norms often indicate gender roles with women from marginalized community facing compounded socio economic challenges issues such as child marriage limited educational opportunity and restricted mobility further perpetuate their marginalization fourth point is impact of globalization globalization has a dual impact while it has created new economic uh, new economic opportunities it has also marginalized certain cultural groups for example traditional livelihoods of tribal communities are threatened by industrialization and urbanization leading to displacement and loss of cultural identity then the fifth point is policy implications government policies aimed at addressing socio economic inequalities often fail to account for cultural diversities the one size fits all approaches may overlook the unique challenges faced by specific cultural groups exacerbating marginalities instead of alleviating them so coming to conclusion the correlation between india's cultural diversities and socio economic marginalities is complex and multifaceted while there are clear instances where cultural identities contribute to socio economic disadvantages addressing these disparities requires 
approaches that consider the interplay of culture, identity and socio-economic status. So this is all about part 4 of GS1 paper that is question number 16 to question number 20 question analysis and answer approach discussion. So this completes the GS1 paper. In the next video we are coming up with GS2 paper questions and answer approach. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video. Till then, happy answer writing.